Hello, everyone, and welcome to our early weekly comic review. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where every week when the comics arrive to our store, we bag, we board them, and then we divide up the ones that we most want to read, the ones we think most people want to hear about, and we do this spoiler light review show. So basically, we're going to tell you all the collectible reasons you might want these comics, first appearances, major events, but more than that, we're going to tell you what each one is about, particularly issue number ones, where when you go to your store Wednesday, you're going to know if this really sounds like something that you want to spend your money on, if it's really up your alley or not. Sort of a uh, medium to small week this week. Mm -hmm. Still, a few noteworthy things. You can see the first batches in front of us. We're going to go over these comics, the ones off to the side that we have, their variants and incentives. I think all said and done, we'll hit about 19 comics today. So without further ado, I believe you have a pretty big one you want to start with. Yeah, it's a big one this week, and I hope that a bunch of people pick this up. If you've been reading um, World's Finest, Batman Superman World's Finest, if you've been reading Robin, I think this is your next stop is to pick up Batman vs. Robin number one. So this is by the writer of uh, World's Finest, Mark Wade writer of many things in the history of comics, uh, but also the art is done by Mahmoud Asrar, which is fantastic. And this kind of picks up on a, a little bit of uh, what's been going on. You can't go into this without reading those previous series, but it's definitely more rewarding if you had read those. So this uh, starts off with just a little explanation of who Damien is. He is a... Uh, a, a Hit of two worlds, um, you know, part uh, assassin family, part bat family, and kind of what that means for him growing up, and uh, maybe his guilt uh, that, you know, he feels that he's part of the reason Alfred died, a bunch of stuff that uh, is pretty complex. That's just the opening part, kind of gets you re-familiar with the character. And then we go to Bruce Wayne who is returning to Wayne Manor. He hasn't been there in a long time. He's kind of set up shop in Gotham City proper, and now he's um, not 100% sure why he's going back, maybe just to check up on things, make sure that everything's all good. Uh, and he's kind of reminiscing about the house and all the memories that are there and everything. That is all until there's a knock on the door. And he ponders, you know... No one should know I'm here. I'm, you know, this was just a whim. And I don't really want to give away who's at the front door. It's already been spoiled on a lot of websites and stuff. But I will say uh, a pretty surprising person is at the door. Now, this all kind of, uh, it, it's really fun to see because if someone Batman's not expecting at the front door shows up, uh, he's not just going to, like, welcome them in. He's going to give them a rigorous a test of questions and trials to make sure they are who they say they are because, you know, this could be anybody. But they uh, they seem to pass all his tests. But there is something about the, the house that is bugging Bruce. And he can't quite put his finger on it, but there's something kind of pulling at him that's going to be leading him down to the Batcave. And he does figure out that this thing that's pulling him is magic. So what is magic going on here? Uh, we don't quite know, but he is met with Damien. There's a group of three, but I'll tell you that Damien is one of them there. Another character that's there is a character that has been very rarely spotted in the DC universe, more commonly found in the Vertigo universe, a character we haven't seen for quite a while. Very cool to see this character show up in DC proper. Um, but, uh, yeah, like the name suggests, there is a fight, Batman versus Robin. Now, what is going on between them? What causes this? You will have to read it to find out because it is explained what has led to this confrontation. It, there's, there's more to it than just uh, hurt feelings. You'll have to see. But along with uh, that, this strange magic that's going on, Bruce and his new companion are going to figure out where it's coming from, and they go to seek the help of someone very very good in the magical arts. It is Zatanna. So there is so much going on in this book. That is, like, 
10% of what happens in this book. I think it's a little bit oversized, but it's fantastic. You know, the I, I don't want to spoil anything because I want everyone to experience it when they read it because there's so many cool things going on in this. And it really sets up a very interesting story going forward that really could impact the DC universe. So highly recommend Batman versus Robin, number one. Definitely the biggest book of the week. I mean, I, I didn't even talk about it. There's a fight scene in this that... Um, has Batman fighting off other versions of his suits. So That's you'll have to see that. That's pretty cool. How does Batman fight his old suits? So that is our A cover. I can say Andy's been gushing about this one. And this is before, because you got the preview version. Yeah. So this is like weeks ago. and you, you know, Yeah, so. yeah. I've been looking forward to rereading it, and I got more out of it this time. We've got the Jason Fabok cover. Very cool. We have the Zatanna Middleton cover. That's why it's not really a spoiler. She's in it. And that's a really good cover. It's a really good cover. And but wait till you see her because once again, there's a lot of surprises. Uh I don't know. You you've got to see it. You'll be shocked when you see Zatanna in this. We also have a one in twenty-five Perio variant. Kind of dark, very cool, that you can get from us if you're one of our customers for $20. All right, so one I've been highly anticipating is I read Midnight Suns number one. That's right, the Midnight Suns are back. I love the Midnight Suns back in the <laughs> 90s, and it took a while, but here they are again. It's a new team, though, so check out the cover. You see some faces that you recognize from the old team. There's you know. so much leather on that cover. That's just <laughs> cool '90s leather. That's right. That, that that I totally had a black leather jacket in the <laughs> '90s. I wore to school, and I love it. Um, so in this, it's going to begin with where is she? She's up. Oh, so bad at doing this. She's up here. This is Zoe Laveau. Okay, she is one of the students at Strange Academy. For those of you who read Strange Academy, you'll know who she is. For those of you who don't, it's okay. You get a little introduction. You get It starts at Strange Academy. Well, Zoe has a apocalyptic dream where she is helping this new evil force. Like, she has turned into this big evil thing, and this evil force in her are fighting the Midnight Suns and trying to uh, bring about the end of the world. And by Midnight Suns, I mean this new group. Yeah. So she wakes up from her dream and it turns out it wasn't just a dream. It was a shared vision that pretty much every magic user in the Marvel Universe got to see. So guess what? Everybody is after her now. <laughs> They're all like, uh, you know, this girl's not supposed to be bad. But at the same time, you know, we just saw her, you know, trying to destroy the entire world. So we might need to stop her before this actually happens. Correct. And of course, this upsets her because, you know, she wants to be a hero. Mm -hmm. You know, she is not somebody who ever has thought about being a villain or would ever do anything like that. So she thinks it's this new apocalyptic force, which there is a character in this that is new, but like there's no real name. Mm -hmm. It's sort of just the big bad looking thing that's trying to destroy <laughs> the world, world along with her. Um, so when all the magic users in the Marvel Universe see this, they start to gather, particularly the ones that were in the vision. Um, and that's what sort of forms this new team. So this new team is formed by, hey, we were in that vision. I guess we should all get together and figure this <laughs> out. Even though if you think about it, it's almost like they're, we should stay away prophecy. from each other. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty funny because Wolverine is not a magician. So he doesn't get this vision, <laughs> nothing. They have to go to Wolverine and go, look, sorry, you're you're a part of this. Uh, he doesn't struggle too much. You know, you got to have Wolverine on a yeah. Midnight Suns team. But a lot of new people as well. Uh, the other thing I'll say is they figure out through a manner, you'll have to read, that they have four days until this vision comes real. So everybody's trying to either help Zoe, capture Zoe, uh, one particularly powerful magic user sort of is going to try to whisk her away. We'll see what happens with that. And in the end, you got to remember, not everybody who wields magic in the Marvel Universe is good. A major villain, a major magic-using villain shows up wanting 
to uh, take Zoe away for themselves. And you'll have mm. to see who that is. So a very strong, awesome issue right out the gate. Uh, it makes use of all the, the cool leather costuming <laughs> that Andy pointed out. And we have uh, some variant covers I'd like to show. So here is the Vincentini cover. And then we also have, this is the video game cover. This, of course, is the Midnight Suns upcoming video game. But that's not what this is based on. This no, is this still is in just its proper own, Marvel this universe. This is, yeah, yeah, this is this is definitely proper Marvel universe. And then check this out. They got Kevin Eastman to do a 1 in 25 that we're selling to our customers for $35. I like that little scrunched up Wolverine. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen these two drawn quite this way. No. But, I mean, that's Kevin Eastman for you. It fits perfect in his time frame, too, of drawing. Uh, early 90s, you know. There you throw go. Casey Jones in there as well. They'd all be friends. Okay, next up for me is an issue I've been looking forward to since it was teased uh, a few months ago. This is Amazing Spider-Man number nine. And this is actually a Hellfire Gala tie-in issue. So, yes, the Hellfire Gala has been over for quite a while now, um, but in it we saw, we know Mary Jane was kind of possessed by Myra, and she got flung through a portal, and in during the Hellfire Gala issue, you had Spider-Man and Wolverine jump in after her. Well, that is what this issue is, is following what happened in that whole scenario. So, it doesn't start immediately there. What is really fun is it has Spider-Man going around the Hellfire Gala talking to people. And this is written so well. The art is by Patrick Gleason, by the way. So the art is fantastic. Uh, but it's really funny of him kind of like trying to fit into these different click groups. And they're not getting his jokes. And uh, oh, uh, there's even a part where he goes up to Mr. Sinister. And Mr. Sinister's like, your webs actually come out of your... And he's like, no, they don't. He's like, do you want them to? Because he's such a... He manipulates DNA and stuff. It's really funny. But um, this does lead into all this stuff going down with Mary Jane. We get a little bit more uh, kind of close of that, what happened with her during that whole event and everything. And then it leads to a big fight as they jump through there into Paris, France. You'll have to see why. Um where Wolverine and Spider-Man have a big fight. It's very cool. It's just a great team-up issue of these two characters. I love seeing Wolverine and Spider-Man together. They're a classic classic duo. Uh, Two-fourths of, I guess, one half of the new Fantastic Four. That kind of thing. So they've got a lot of uh, camaraderie. But I will say that on this mission... We, it's not just like, oh, this is just a tie-in with the X-Men. No, because this, apparently the Hellfire Gala took place post a lot of the stuff that's been going on in Amazing Spider-Man. So he does have his new uh, goblin-like suit in this. So that's kind of where the timeline falls. And there is kind of our first significant interaction between Peter and Mary Jane about what's been going on between them, which I know a lot of people have been eagerly anticipating and questioning what what could have happened to separate them and i'll say you will get a little piece of the puzzle that maybe it's not all spider-man's fault maybe some of it is mary jane's uh maybe it has more to do with her so you'll have to read to find out but the art in this is fantastic anytime patrick gleason is drawing spider-man it is top notch some great great stuff going on in this issue so that is our ramita jr a cover. We have our Romero variant with Aranya. And I believe this is also for the, uh, yeah, the Vo Marvel Voices themed month. And then speaking of Patrick Gleason, we have this beautiful Patrick Gleason variant where it kind of looks like Spider-Man saying, no, Mary Jane, Wolverine's my man, and taking him away, but... Yeah, his senses cold. are tingling. Somebody's <laughs> trying to take his Wolverine away. Yeah, don't, don't mess with Spider-Man's Wolverine. So, yep, that's Amazing Spider-Man number nine. Okay, so I read Flash 
Fastest Man Alive number one. This is a three issue mini series that is an official movie tie in. It says it right at the bottom there. So the Flash movie has been put off so many <laughs> times that DC finally was like, okay, we have this prequel comic. Let's just release it. Like we we need to, you know, pay, pay the people who did this or. I don't know why they're releasing this now, because it's like, if the movie got pushed back, why not push this back? Yeah. Because uh, for those of you who don't know, the movie date now is June 2023. So this is going to be long over <laughs> yeah. to the time it comes out. Uh, however, I still did enjoy reading it, and I'm really interested in this movie for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. So this is set in that movie universe. This is Barry Allen. He is a young, inexperienced Flash. This is not like the Barry Allen you'll read in the regular DC comic universe. So in this, he goes up against this villain who is sort of uh, tough as steel. His name is Girder. Mm -hmm. He's a really big dude. He's big and tough like steel. And Flash can't hurt him. He has trouble hurting this person. Uh, so what does he do? He goes to another major DC cinematic universe hero who has a major <laughs> uh movie franchise you can pretty much guess who it is but i won't say it and he says hey will you teach me to fight so that's some of the best parts of this mm -hmm. is the you know this young experienced barry allen learning to fight from somebody who definitely is one of the greatest fighters in the dc <laughs> universe or cinematic universe either so that kind of clues me in. Okay, well, looks like that character is going to be in this movie too. Mm. Um, will this Girder character? It's hard to say because um, so Flash definitely has to fight him. But why is Girder trying to kill Flash? Because he's literally trying to kill him. You'll have to read the comic to find out. There is backstory on this villain and why he's trying to kill Flash. And how it ends up, it doesn't end up as simple as, oh, he's going to be a villain in the movie. They're at, he's actually left in an interesting position where if he's in the movie, I don't know if he's going to appear as a villain. Hmm. So you'll have to read how it all goes down. So I'd say that's some of my favorite parts of this. But I will say by the end of the first issue, this is almost like a one shot. Like I know there's two more coming, but it doesn't really leave off where you need the other two. I guess they're going to explore more of the universe. Maybe yeah. other uh, DC cinematic characters will appear Hard to say, but that is what is going on in Flash, Fastest Man Alive, number one of three. I wonder if they're going to spread these out one every like three months or something, <laughs> make it make it fill up that gap. Maybe. So here is the Ferriera variant. And if you're currently on the main Flash series, it's doubtful your comic shop is going to pull this for you. Mm -hmm. It's a different creative team. It is not Wally West Flash. It's not even set in the DC comic universe. So you may have to call your shop or drop by or ask if you are just a Flash fan and you just you yeah. want this one as well. Yeah, we, we know that there's a certain character going to be appearing in the movie. And I think a lot of people are excited for that issue because we haven't seen a clear picture of what his new suit's going to look like. So I think that's going to be really cool. I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm interested to see kind of the redesign for a very uh, classic version of a character. Okay, so next up for me is a book that I didn't know a whole lot about going into, but I know pretty well the creative team. This is, like the whole title, The Bone Orchard Mythos, 10,000 Black Feathers, number one. It's a, it's a seven-word uh, title. So this is a universe that Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino have been working for a while. I believe... It, uh, the first few, weren't they graphic novels, like hardback, it's a few of those? I don't remember single issues, but it possibly could have been. Um, so I didn't know anything about this other than kind of how the cover aesthetics were and everything. I could kind of tell it was pseudo-horror. But I was really interested when I started to read this, because one, I was worried uh, if there's been previous Bone Orchard um, books. I think there was a miniseries and they did like a graphic novel later. I was worried maybe I wouldn't understand this, but it actually re reads like a pretty straightforward uh, number one issue of a book. And I think that really speaks to how Jeff Lemire is as a storyteller. So it follows a character named Trish who um, is coming, it not initially put this way, but she's coming home to her hometown. Um, she is an author and she said, oh, well, I'm going to make my, you know, my my signing tour 
go through my hometown just to check back up on it and see how it's going. But when she runs into an old friend, or actually a mom of a friend, when she gets there, she kind of confides in her that her last few books have not been selling well. And she's really coming home to just, like, take a break for a minute. Everything. This is all interspersed with um, a story from the past of Trish as a little girl meeting um, another girl named Jackie kind of their first day of school, and Jackie is very precocious, uh, questions her when she sees Jackie reading something. Oh, what are you reading? Or uh, Trish was reading something. There's a lot of references to, like, the Wizard of Earthsea, uh, uh, the Dark Tower book series. So it's got a lot of literature uh, overtones in this. But we're slowly seeing in the present that something maybe has happened to um, Jackie and that's kind of been eating away at Trish this whole time. And it starts to get weird when a voice starts speaking to Trish and kind of saying, I always knew you'd come back home, all this kind of stuff. And she suddenly starts seeing these black feathers falling from the sky. I won't give away kind of what all that is, but there it turns uh, very almost Lovecraftian in the end with some of the visuals that you'll see in this. So if you like your kind of, it's a little psychological horror going into maybe real horror, we'll have to see. It's kind of hard to tell in this first issue, but I thought it was a very good. Sorrentino's art is great as usual. If you've read things like, um, what was that big one? Uh, Gideon Falls. Right, Gideon same Falls. team from Gideon Falls. Same team that worked on uh, Green Arrow for DC for a while. Really good, very solid cool horror story. This is, that was our A cover. Then we have, this is the Simmons variant. Simmons from uh, Department of Truth fame. And we have this Christian Ward variant. So I hope a lot of people try this out. If they, if they like this kind of tone, uh, hopefully they won't miss out on it because I think a lot of people would really enjoy this, especially Gideon Falls fans. Okay, so check it out. Kevin Smith is starting up a new comic series. In fact, he started up a new comic sort of uh, imprint. imprint. It's called Secret Stash Comics, which, you know, that's uh, some of the name of, of his store in New Jersey. Yeah. Jay and Silent Bob, Secret Stash in Red Bank, New Jersey. So the new comic is called Masquerade. And you see how it's spelled. Um, there's a little secret on the cover I saw. If you look at the bottom corner, do you see that guy's face holding his face? That is definitely an Action Comics number one homage. <laughs> you know? The oh, guy, yeah. Yeah, near, nearby the car where Superman is, is there lifting it. Okay, so um, this comic is... Done by Kevin Smith, along with screenwriter Andy McElfresh. And so I think one reason you may want to pick this up is it's by two people who don't just do comics, but they do movies. So I would say if you would like to pick things up that might get optioned, this is definitely, I think it's angled to be optioned. Mm -hmm. um, so what it is about, this is set in a crime-ridden city called Trenchin. And Masquerade follows um, Felicia, who is a social media star, and she's also sort of like a, a TV or streaming celebrity, um, where she has a legitimate news show. It's basically like a To Catch a Predator show, mm -hmm. but um, she is so attractive, she uses herself as bait to catch predators. Um, that's what she does by day. Now, at night, she is a vigilante. We haven't found out why. I know by reading the solicitation, she has a dark past, and she is doing this for a reason. They don't get into that in the first issue. Her vigilante self, she has some sort of a, a face mask that can scan people's faces and then make it look like that's her face. I don't know if it like really changes her face or if it's looking that way or if it's a hologram. They don't go into how it works, but um, it, it is disconcerting. You know, like she she uses it on this older gentleman, and so. Uh, it doesn't change her body. So it's like this older, balding guy with her voluptuous body, like walking around, pretending to be him. 
Um, this has the dialogue and action and grittiness and bloodiness you would expect from a Kevin Smith comic. You know, when he isn't working for DC, where, yeah. where he's off the chain to do his own thing. Um, this could just as easily be set in Sin City if um, one of the characters had powers and if it were more updated, you know, in social media mm -hmm. times like it is now. Uh, I thought that the art fit the um, the material very, very well. Uh, good art that, that fit exactly what the writing was. So that's generally what's going on in Masquerade number one. This is for people who want an indie comic that is uh, a, a little dark, a little potty mouth. Um, but, you know. That's a little like Kevin Smith. Correct. That's what <laughs> yeah. you turn indie comics from. I'd also like to mention, so I've been a big Kevin Smith fan since Clerks. Clerks 3 is coming out this week. Mm. It is um, an event movie. So it, I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, Fathom Events is doing it. So I'm going to see it Thursday. <laughs> so those of you out there, Kevin Smith, Smith fans like me, uh, just in case you didn't know, that's your chance to catch it. Because I don't think it's getting a wider release than that. Mm -hmm. It's like a special release. So anyway, go buy your Masquerade comic. Go see Clerks 3. It's a Kevin Smith week here. Uh, <laughs> we have a variant for this as well. This is the Franca Villa variant. There's no denying Franca Villa covers. Yeah. The the oranges and the blues, just tonally. And next up for me is issue two of Predator. I was looking forward to this one. I really liked the first issue and where it left off. I thought this can be really cool. So this is, uh, of course, uh, about this girl named Theta who her parents were killed by a predator, and now she is pretty much stopping at nothing to hunt down that predator. There, he's got some distinctive marks, and she is hunting him. But to hunt him, uh, she uses a device that kind of opens her up to other predators, and so she has to fight them along the way as they come after her. So at the end of the last one, something happened in her ship, it was her parent ship, crash land on a snowy planet, very Hoth-like planet. And uh, this is a habit habitated, inhabited, 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 <laughs> inhabited planet. Um, but the nearest civilization is pretty far away. And her uh, computer system warns her like, hey, you're probably going to die if you go out there. You only have enough. Uh, supplies to last eight days and she's like well i really don't have a choice but we know from the last one that the predators have their eye on her on this planet so uh most of this is her traversing this tundra uh coming up against different alien beasts having to fight them off maybe even eat a few of them coming in contact with uh other pseudo humanoid life forms which i thought was really interesting i didn't i never really put other aliens in the world of alien like kind of star warsy aliens but they kind of introduced that idea in here as well but uh the she goes through a lot of danger while traversing all this but it's nowhere near as dangerous as when she finally makes it to her destination and you have to find out what happens when she gets there but spoiler it does involve predators in a book called in Predator. A book called Pre unbelievable yeah yeah what do they think of next but it is very it's a very solid issue kev walker's art in this is great i love his like designs for her snow suit and all of that very very cool it's very reminiscent of um almost more alien uh look than predator because this is set in the future and you can kind of believe that these are in the same universe by the ship designs and the clothing designs, all that. So that is Predator number two. This scene does not happen, but hopefully maybe the next issue will get a big fight. We've also got the Bustos variant. Even right there, it almost looks like they're teamed up. And then we have a 1 in 25 LaRocca variant. We're selling to our customers for $20. I love the look of Predator and Snow. That was one of the coolest parts about Alien vs. Predator. It's just the setting in the snow. I thought that was always really cool. All right, another book I read that I greatly enjoyed is Edge of the Spider-Verse number three. 
So, you know, this is setting up the big Spider-Verse event where we're kind of seeing our different characters that will be involved and where they come from. So uh, in this one, we have a first appearance of Night Spider. So Night Spider is actually Felicia Hardy from another universe where she was being Black Cat, but something happens that changes her into Night Spider. And I'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Otherwise, you have Spider-Man of India and you have Sakura Spider. So three different stories. The first story is Spider-Man of India, a character who's a fan favorite, hasn't been seen in quite some yeah. time. And uh, it was a really good story. He's sort of musing what it's like to be Spider-Man of India, what it's like to be a Spider-Man at all, what it's like to meet these other Spider-Men throughout the, the multiverse. It's weird because each page is one image with his thoughts. And it's different Marvel universes. You know, it's like mm. Marvel Universe 1160, Marvel Universe this. So I couldn't tell if he's traversing through these or if there are just multiple Spider-Man of India's in mm. throughout so many multiverses. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, but I will say it is funny. He muses on how when he meets other Spider-Man, they call him Spider-Man India. And he's like, I don't think of myself that way. Yeah. <laughs> that is funny. So, yeah. yeah, that's pretty amusing. The second story, though, I really liked. It is the story of Night Spider. That was my favorite one. Of course, I'm a huge Black Cat fan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of obvious for me. Black Cat is already so awesome. Give her spider powers, too. I mean, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what the story is about. This story is about her getting the powers and how it's too good. Like she gets bored with how great she is mm -hmm. with these powers. You know, it's like she gets to a vault and whereas before she'd have to pick it or whatever, she just yanks it off the wall because <laughs> she has the strength. Um, but what's really interesting is how does she get the powers? I'm not going to tell you. It does have to do with something spider related, but it is not like a bug you know mm. it's not a bug bites her it is something peter different. parker doesn't bite her <laughs> confirm or deny <laughs> that uh but what i will say is she is going to be in this event so i'm really looking forward to that i mean putting felicia hardy in on any team book uh, is a win for me mm -hmm. even though she doesn't need a team it's sort of her charm the third story is sakura spider which um, they've already told her origin of how she got turned into a spider character. This continues her origin story. This is more like her her Uncle Ben mm. origin. The issue story. two of the uh, yeah, of the you know origin. what what makes her you know power responsibility yeah. that that whole thing. So that is what is going on in Edge of the Spider Verse number three. I think a lot of people are going to want to pick this up for many reasons, but it's also just a good read. And this variant, the Anka variant is awesome with night spider i love her suit design it, it it's perfect mix of you know you look at that you go oh that's black cat but you see those little spider and then if you want to go even better here is the one in ten design variant that we're selling to our customers for ten dollars while supplies last this makes you wonder how they get those uh, spider eyes to just stick on their skin. You know, that has to be some kind of weird adhesion. Craft glue. Oh, yeah. Just Elmer's. Just they turn their face up and squirt Elmer's all over their face. Okay, next up for me is our next installment of another long title, World Without a Justice League Wonder Woman featuring Martian Manhunter. You forgot the Dark Crisis part. Oh my gosh, the most important part. Dark Crisis, World Without a Justice League, Wonder Woman, also starring Martian Manhunter. So this, of course, uh, like I have to do too much explaining to this, is another installment in these... You, I don't want to say they're perfect worlds for these superheroes, because in a couple of them, it hasn't been perfect, but it is kind of crafted in favor of them. I don't know, it's weird. Just like Green Lantern's, like, he was still fighting bad guys. It's not like, you know, all evil is gone. And it's like that with this Wonder Woman. One, her suit in this is awesome. That is her main suit through the entire thing. It's just gold armor. And in it, she is running late because uh, she's having to take care of a fight, an issue. But she is running late to Etta Candy, her best friend, is getting inaugurated to be president. So it, in her perfect world, which is kind of nice, uh, her best friend is becoming president. And so she's going to try to be there for that event. Uh, Etta, of course, understands that she has a lot to do. But 
she's not only going to visit, but she is picking up Edda and taking her to Paradise Island, which is now three islands. Uh, I have to really look at that page close to figure out why is it three. Um, because Edda is getting sworn in as an honorary Amazonian as well. This seems like Edda's perfect world. But even in this perfect world, there's some dark stuff going on. And one of them is that the Amazonians have been keeping a secret from Wonder Woman. And she's about to discover what that is and really throw her feelings about the Amazonians and Paradise Island um, in a pretty dark way where she's, she doesn't know if she can fully trust them now. Um, so that's kind of the gist of that story. Now, the backup story, the Martian Manhunter one, is weird it's very cool it is a if you know anything about martian manhunter john jones um, that his um alias is a detective that was just kind of a classic thing he's kind of a private eye uh in some of the versions he works for a police force but that is uh what this one is this is black and white with just touches of color and in his world um, he is a detective, but I think it's kind of commenting on how he's always felt a little bit of an outsider because he talks about, well, the, I guess this is a little bit in the future that humans have finally decided to splice their DNA with, um, superior beings that are better at adapting to things like squids. And so everyone in the world looks like a Cthulhu-like monster with tentacle growing off their face. They're bald, or they have tentacles for hair, and a tentacle like beard thing. Uh, it shows everyone like that. And he is he looks like that, but with like a trench coat on and everything. And there has been a murder that he is investigating that has some cryptic clues around it that he is going to look into. And when you find out who the culprit is... It's also pretty uh, pretty surprising and will make you question a lot of this story, but very cool, very weird. And I do know that in an upcoming Dark Crisis issue, we will be seeing this character again, this version, because it refers to him in it as the Martian Squid Hunter, which, I mean, there you go. There's a whole new universe for you, is the Martian Squid Hunter. So just the one cover for this one. World Without Justice League, Wonder Woman. All right, so I read Venom issue number 10. So let's check out the cover. On the cover, we have Meridius. You can tell because of the things coming out of the head there. And he's attacking uh, multiple Venoms. So um, this is a very mind-bending issue, and the art that goes with it is really good. Very mind-bending art at points that work really well with it. Uh, Al Ewan, you know, he always has these big stories to tell, and this is no exception. So in this, you you learn, you kind of learned last issue, but you learn a lot more for sure who Bedlam is. And it's a little bit shocking as to who Bedlam is. Uh, you also learn a lot more about the Garden of Time, where Eddie has been sort of imprisoned with Meridius. He's there with all these other versions of King and Blacks that come after him. And I think there's like a total of six of them. Well, there is a seventh that is talked about in this issue. It's not seen, but there's a seventh one. So if you guys read other sites, some are saying there's a seventh Venom, but they don't really clarify. <laughs> That's what that means. There's a seventh King in Black. Um, now, who are all these people? Who really is Meridius? All that gets revealed this issue. There's a lot of revelations this issue. Um on top of that, Dylan Brock is in real danger because of Bedlam, and it's all Eddie's fault, and you will read about why that is this issue. So really, um, if you've been reading Venom, this answers a lot of questions that you've probably had since the early issues of this run. So a good, cool issue, very mind-bending issue of Venom, and here we have the Sakira variant. And we have the final issue of Star Wars Obi-Wan. This is part five of five, and this is a very cool issue. So 
what's been going on, of course, is Obi-Wan has been um, kind of uh, reminiscing over some of his past adventures as he's waiting for this sandstorm on Tatooine to blow over. Now, it ended in the last one, and now we are caught up to him kind of pseudo-present day. It seems like it's not too far before A New Hope starts. And there is, um, there's been some, during the sandstorm, some Tusken Raiders have raided a Imperial camp and stolen some supplies. And a Imperial officer tells a couple of sand troopers, go and get our supplies back and eradicate these Tusken Raiders. So that's kind of part where most of where the story we follow is those sand troopers going out and looking for him. It doesn't go well for them. And Obi-Wan comes across one of the sand troopers who is still alive and kind of nurses him back to health and maybe changes the mind of the sand trooper, what he thinks about what he's doing. Um, you have to read it to get the full story, but it's a very cool story and a very nice, you know, there's no like to be continued or Obi-Wan will be back in. No, um, this even goes right up until there's a little bit of time jump and we basically see uh, the events of A New Hope in this. So it's pretty cool. You can kind of see where it falls. And this has some cool variants as well. We've got this uh, Choose Your Destiny with Skier from High Republic. And we have this U variant as well. And also this week, we've got Star Wars Bounty Hunters. This is Bounty Hunters issue number 27. Uh, this is part one of a new story arc. So if you're looking for a place to jump on, I think this one is pretty good. Uh, and the arc is called Havoc at the uh, Accretion Disco. So uh, they, this group of bounty hunters has to protect some criminals who are going to a big party and they know they're going to get attacked there, but they still want to party it up, and they have to defend them. So, pretty cool issue of Bounty Hunters. And we have the Ken Lashley variant for that one. Okay, so I checked out this new comic from Image called The Least We Can Do. And so on the cover, you see our main character there. She is holding a gem. Notice the other characters. Um, look sort of post-apocalyptic but with machinery and that is sort of the setting for this book so this is set in a post-apocalyptic future but it's not one of these post-apocalyptics where the world is like all trash like basically the world has been rebuilt so our society on earth it sort of ended for certain reasons it got rebuilt so now it sort of resembles medieval times mixed with some technology and a bit of magic there are these uh, elements that look like they're mostly gems that have this powerful force that can be used for all kinds of things. And uh, our main character, who you see at the top, she is collecting these because she wants to use them to do good. That is basically where the title is all about. She feels that is the least she can do is try to do some good. Um, so the story is told very fast. It's um, the, the dialogue. It's one of these books where um, the people talk a little more than they do in other comics, think a little more. Uh, the, the art style is very uh, bright and clear. It's sort of its own style. It definitely has a little bit of a manga edge to it, but not enough where I'd say that's like a hard edge. Mm -hmm. um, the, the story is told very indie in a way that I would call sort of unpolished. You know, it doesn't feel like it went through a lot of editors. It feels like they just did it. It's how they want to tell it. But I would say this is a comic I think will appeal to a younger crowd. Not that, not not like, you know, below age 13, but like newer comic readers. It has that feel to mm -hmm. it. I, I don't know if it would appeal as much to like more classic comic readers, even classic indie comic readers. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just my take. So that is generally what is going on in The Least We Can Do. And it has this Romboli variant. 
not to can be confused with uh, the folded over pizza called Stromboli. <laughs> this is the Romboli variant. Oh, good. I'm glad you clarified that. I, I know. I was about to say, just a pizza case. drew it? No. Uh, next up, I've got Superman Son of Kal-El number 15. And I was kind of shocked. This is the last part of this story that's pretty much been going on since issue one. Or at least it's been building from there. The Bendix story, the big organization, the big bad guy uh, that has been plaguing Jonathan Kent since he's taken over the role of Superman. Uh, all of that comes to a close in this. Uh, and Lex Luthor and Bendix go head to head. Uh, and, you know, it's Lex Luthor. What are you going to do when you go up against Lex Luthor? So that was very interesting. And I'm very excited to see where it goes from there because we know that uh, Clark Kent is coming back into the picture in the next issue. Um, and there is something big that happens that we're kind of seeing that maybe Jonathan is going to have some powers that are a little bit different than his father. There's it, not a whole lot is spoken about it, but there's there's some stuff that happens in this that make him question something. And then finally... Uh, a big part of this, you'll probably see it in uh, news articles and stuff, but Jonathan makes a pretty public declaration about his feelings towards Jay in this that uh, have been a long time coming if you've been reading this series. So that is Superman, Son of Kal-El, number 15. It's our A cover. And then we have our Talaski variant as well. All right, so I read Captain Marvel issue of number 41. This is the end of this current arc that has Captain Marvel um, where the magical tribunal has put her on trial and she has to fight this dragon over and over again to prove that she doesn't hate all magic and she's not a bad person. Well, last issue, she escaped the tribunal. She made it back to New York where, guess what? There was a dragon in New York. So in this issue, she has to reunite with her sister, with Binary, with Jessica Drew, and they must try to fight this dragon, and maybe this can be her last challenge to prove herself to the tribunal. You'll have to read to see how that goes. Also, Binary. Some things are decided with what's going to go along with Binary, and you'll kind of see what happens to uh, the future of Binary for the next little while by the end of this issue. So, end of the arc. And uh, we do not have the variant for that one. We, we ran out of that one. Okay, and I have Daredevil. This is Daredevil number three in the uh, continuing pseudo-sequel series. Uh, so in this, it's funny, We it, it talks a lot about some weird stuff happened in the previous issue with... Um, somebody coming up to Daredevil and being like, I'm the one who's orchestrated your entire life and all this stuff. And then that little part ended and it's basically like Daredevil's like, that was weird. I'm going back to doing what I was doing. But we know that that storyline is going to pop up again. But, uh, you know, Daredevil and Elektra now are kind of the head of the Fist, a group that's very similar to the Hand, but a little bit more clenched. Um, and he is kind of going about it the right way where he's going to different people in the city, some higher ups and all that, and kind of trying to get them not on board, but like their approval or their, you know, be on my side. So he goes to a, uh, a, a detective or a, a member of the police that he's been friends with, talks to him about it. And he even goes and sees Luke Cage, who, you know, is running for mayor and tries to get his kind of OK that he operates the fist uh, in the city. But also he has a run in with someone from Electra's past that I think is a character we don't see too often. That is pretty cool. Um, so that is the main story of Daredevil number three. And we have the uh, Seguera, I think this one's called the promo cover, which we can see on there, it does look like we are going to be getting that confrontation with Punisher coming up. 
which just seemed inevitable. All right. I read Love Everlasting, number two, the book from Tom King and Elsa Chartier. And um, so this is a lot like issue number one, where we have this one girl who is in these sort of romance tales. They have to do with um, somebody desiring love and struggling to find it. And they get it, they lose it, and then they get it again. So this is begins in sort of like a Downton Abbey place. And it's about a, a girl who grows up with the Lord of the Manor. They're like kids together. And if she doesn't have money, her family's like the service. They're the help. So she grows up to be his maid. But the two were friends. They were young lovers. And of course, when they're adults, they want to be in love again. But this is against what his family wants. Um, but what shifts in this one is the time, like the story will go so far that all of a sudden it'll move up so many years. And so instead of Downton Abbey, it'll be like 50 years later, but it's similar characters in a similar situation. So it's like a continued story just showing how the setting and time changes. But that that sort of love story could be in any time um, of two people from two different walks of life. I have to say it ends pretty bloody. And I'd also like to say, if anybody is looking for like a continuity to all this, I don't know if there is. Maybe there will be eventually. Definitely not now. This is good. You have to want to read the genre of this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Tom King is trying to tell some bigger story. He might be, but it's either going to take a very long time where you might get frustrated if that's what you're looking for, or it might not be there at all. But he is doing a good job of telling these interesting historical romance stories. Um, you know, that's not really my genre to read. But I have to say, reading it, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. So that's... You just got to be along for the ride. Sort of a thumbs up for me on I'm reading something <laughs> I don't think I would pick up. But, you know, it's Tom King and the art's really good. So... If something's done well, even if it's not your taste, you can tell when something's done well. Right. And I think that's that's how this is going to be for a yeah. lot of people. I just think that some people are, are not going to like it because they're going to go, okay, well, why the time jumps? And is this all going to get explained? I don't know if it is. And I've heard that the first bunch of issues of this was released digitally mm. and that even further in, there's no explanation of it. So I'm just warning all the readers, <laughs> like it for the right reason. Yeah. Like, for instance, this great variant cover by Terry Dodson. Love it. Yeah, that's really good. And then here is another variant. This is the Samson variant. Okay, and I believe my last one is Axe Judgment Day. This is number four. So, as you can see on there, that hand is about to, to either give the thumbs up or the thumbs down to a lot of people. And, of course, that's what this issue is about. Is, uh, some of the Eternals make a play to Eros, Star Fox, because they know that his power is can he can manipulate emotions of people and things. They want to get him to manipulate this celestial that's judging everybody. And I guess make him a little bit happier, I don't know. But he kind of retorts like, you know, if that doesn't work then that is a surefire way for all of us to get judged negatively and get destroyed. So uh, Star Fox has a lot to do with this. I think a big part of this event was to bring him back into the fold and kind of explain what he's been doing. Uh, he even kind of goes into detail about while he was away, how his mindset has changed a little bit. And he's kind of come back as a relatively new character. I think we're going to learn more about that in his one shot that's coming up. But uh, more people in this get judged as well, including uh, Dr. Doom, which it's I, I question the Celestials ways of judging people because uh, Doom pretty much just tells them, ah, don't worry about it. I don't care what you say anyways. Um, but we get people like Professor X. What we're seeing, is, too, is, uh, I don't think I've talked about it on the show, one of the ways that he judges people is by presenting himself to them as someone from their life or their past. So uh, for Professor X, he comes to him as Legion, his son, to judge him. 
Uh, I think we even saw in an upcoming issue with the Spider-Man that Gwen Stacy is going to be how she confronts Peter about all of that. So it is interesting to see what he appears to them as to be judged. But, you know, he's given thumbs up. He's given thumbs down all around. No way you can keep track with how many of each is going on. But finally, uh, they the Eternals go back to a big thing that they love doing, the Unimind. If you watch the movie, they even kind of brought the Unimind into that. And uh, Star Fox is up for a vote for a new title he may take on. You'll have to read it to find out what that one is. But uh, there is kind of the final judgment from the Celestial in this. And let's just say this is a very dark issue, especially the last few pages. Um, some stuff that goes on with Captain America is very, very dark. Uh, I know this is only issue four. We've still got a few issues left. I kind of hope we do get a, a blue sky at some point because it is very dark. But a very interesting issue, especially all the judging and how, how it determines who's worthy and who's not, I think is really interesting. So that is issue number four of Max Judgment Day. And we have this, I already put it up here, this Zulo cat variant. I like Cat Thor. Cat Storm with her cat mohawk. And we also have this. Peach Momoko variant. All right, my last ones to go over real quick. I read Iron Man number 23. Tony Stark is trying to purchase the Mandarin rings. So look at the cover. Somebody in a suit of armor wearing a bunch of Mandarin rings. Hard to tell who. You will know by the end of this issue. And let's just say it's not going to be good news. So um, Spy Master sets up a meeting with Tony Stark where Tony Stark is trying to buy the rings or he will fight for them, anything he needs to do. But it might be that it isn't the Spy Master you think it is. Another great issue of Iron Man. If you've been reading it, I think you already know. Uh, every issue is written really well. The art is awesome. I think Iron Man has really good comic art. And here is the variant. This is the Manipole Beyond variant. And lastly, I didn't get a chance to read it, but I would like to say that Wonder Woman issue number 791 is out this week. Here is the variant cover. This is the Gillum March Harley Quinn 30th anniversary variant cover that some of you might be interested in. And with that, that is our show. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope we have done our job and we have told you about these comics. And now you know which ones that you want for sure, which ones don't sound like that you want. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos. Megan will be on tonight on Whatnot at 7 o'clock selling stuff for her, her you know, late night sales videos. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back on Friday with comics from the future. So until then, have a great week and thanks for watching.